Rappaport Center's Fall 2020 Colloquium, Inequality, Labor, and Human Rights, The Future of Work in the Age of Pandemic. Um, today, Dr. Aaron Beninov will present the lecture, Automation and the Future of Work in the Global Pandemic Economy, and Dean Ann Huff Stevens will respond. I'm Karen Engel, I teach at the law school, and along with Neville Hode, I co-direct the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice. Um, and it really is our pleasure to welcome you to this event. As some of you know, we host a colloquium every fall on human rights and inequality, which is also part of an interdisciplinary seminar that we teach in the law school. This year, I'm teaching it with Rappaport Center's new postdoctoral fellow, Michelle Kahn, who is here, um, who has just joined us after completing her PhD in sociology at the University of Chicago. Now this year's colloquium differs from those in previous years in a few ways. Um, one way is that it's also part of the buildup for a new interdisciplinary and cross campus initiative on the future of work, which is generously supported by the office of, Vice President, of the Vice President for Research. We'll be holding a pop-up institute next summer entitled Beyond the Future of Work, New Paradigms for Addressing Global Inequality and are using the colloquium to begin to think in earnest together about these issues. The most obvious difference though, is that we're holding the talks virtually, which means that we do not have our usual food, refreshments, and pre-lecture time for visiting um, with each other. Um, originally dubbed the human rights happy hour when we started it, um, that time to get to meet and greet old and new friends from across campus made the events really special. But there is a silver lining. Though it's after 11 p.m. in Berlin, where our speaker Aaron now lives, he's not jet lagged. And many people have joined us for this lecture from all over the country, as well as from places even further away than Berlin, including Australia and India. Before I introduce our speaker, Aaron Beninov, and respondent, Ann Stevens, I'd like to thank our assistant director, Sarah Eliason, for all her work on coordinating and promoting the event, and Andy Martinez in Media Services for working with Sarah to put together the best Zoom experience possible. So now, with no further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Aaron Beninov, who joins us from Humboldt University in Berlin where he's recently taken up a position as a postdoctoral fellow and the academic coordinator for a research unit called Reallocation, which is part of a seven-year German Research Foundation funded project. He moved to Berlin after spending several years as a Harper Schmidt Fellow at the University of Chicago, before which he completed his PhD in MA in History from UCLA. Aaron is an economic historian who looks at the present and future of work in light of the past, exploring long-term trends and changes over the 20th century into the 21st century and beyond. He's been particular, well, he's been quite prolific in the last few years with writing on topics ranging from automation, universal basic income, service work, the growth of the informal economy, global deindustrialization, and now the pandemic, although I'll say those all have a lot in common for him, um, all through the lens of global economic history and with key insight into underemployment. His critical insights draw on arch archival work at the ILO, UN, OECD, and the World Bank, as his work thinks about the power of categories and concepts to shape how we talk about and act on global challenges around labor. Um, he has a book that's about to come out, it's in page proofs, um, and it's entitled Automation and the Future of Work um, by Verso Books, um, and another on the way on the global history of unemployment since World War II. His work is already shaping the public conversation about automation um, and has appeared in several public forums, including Jacobin's Magazine, The Dig, Jacobin Radio, and The Guardian, and his work has been cited in the New York Times. After Aaron speaks, we'll hear from Ann Huff Stevens, who needs no introduction, um, but I'll give her one anyway. This is her second year at the University of Texas, where she serves as Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and the David Bruton Jr. Regents Chair in Liberal Arts in the Department of Economics. 
Now, when she moved here to be Dean, I imagine she did not realize the magnitude of the job, although she thought it was going to be a pretty demanding job. Um, but the pandemic has added all kinds of twists and turns or thrown many new obstacles. Um, I understand from all involved that she's been amazingly attentive to the uncertainty and anxiety that students, staff, and faculty in COLA face while also keeping her eye on the larger goals and aims of the college. But we didn't invite her here to talk about that, and she's probably quite relieved um, for that. Um, Ann Stevens is an important economic scholar of poverty, particularly in the context of workers and labor markets, the incidence and effects of job loss across generations, safety net dynamics, and more. The pandemic has made her work more important than ever, while also, I imagine, raising new research questions for her as well. We really appreciate her taking the time to think through some of these issues with us today in conversation with Erin's work. So now, in whatever way you like to do virtually, please join me in welcoming Erin Beninoff. Great, thank you so much. So um, I'm going to, this is my first Zoom lecture, so I'm gonna try, hopefully it'll go off without a hitch, but um, I'm gonna share my screen and do part of this with some slides so I can show you guys some images and charts and stuff. And then um, part of it, I will turn that off. So um, I'm gonna try to do that now. Okay, so uh, wonderful. Okay, according to many analysts, the coronavirus crisis is providing us with a sneak preview of our coming digital future. As the virus spreads around the world and lockdowns proliferated, shops were closed and people stayed home. Robots like this one, um, taking care of patients in a hospital in Antwerp, supposedly carry the burden in the wake of humanity's retreat. This narrative about a fast arriving digital future clashed with another narrative about essential workers, or as they're known in Germany, the everyday heroes, who have continued to work crucial jobs uh, for low wages throughout the coronavirus pandemic. Here's Chris Smalls, who was um, famously uh, protesting a lack of protective equipment at the Staten Island Amazon warehouse um, and lost his job there for doing that. So which, which of these stories is true? Did robots save us uh, in the crisis or humanity? To what extent are technologies transforming work um, in the midst of the pandemic? These questions, which have been asked again and again in the past few months, are the latest versions of questions that have been on people's minds in the US for quite some time and broke very um, um, strongly into the public uh, with Andrew Yang's breakout presidential campaign. So are we heading towards a largely automated future? And what would human beings do in that case? Would we be able to adapt our institutions to realize a dream of human freedom that a new age of intelligent machines seems to make possible? Or would that dream turn out to be a nightmare? A new automation discourse, which has been on view again during the crisis, asks just these sort of questions and arrives at a provocative conclusion. These are just a few of the many titles coming out uh, around this topic. So these authors say that in one, one variant or another, that mass technological unemployment is coming and it must be managed by the provision of universal basic income since large sections of the population will lose access to the wages that they need to live. Do the automation theorists have the story right? It's certainly true in my view that um, the resurgence of the automation discourse today responds to a real global trend. There are too few jobs for too many people. Chronic labor under demand manifests in a number of trends, not only in a higher average rate of unemployment, but also in trends like this one. Um, this is a, just a graph from the Economic Policy Institute. Now, you know, a little bit outdated because it doesn't cover the current crisis, but what it shows is the increasing length of time after each recession um, to restore the level of jobs that existed right before the recession started. So this is the process of what's been called um, jobless recoveries. That's one economic trend. Two others I'll show you later, um, stagnating real wages and more broadly rising economic inequality. And of course, these trends around jobs intensified dramatically um, during the present year. Um, 
you can kind of see if you if you look at this graph on the left hand side this is the uh just the unemployment rate taken from the fed um for the past you know since world war ii you can see on the left hand side the spikes are actually kind of thinner and that thinness of the spikes is the fact that the economy recovers pretty quickly um, after a crisis, people lose their jobs, but then they get them very quickly back. And then as you move to the right, you can see the spikes kind of widen. And again, that's that same process of jobless recoveries, taking longer and longer for the economy to recover. And then, of course, on the far right-hand side of this graph, you see this very high level of unemployment, 14.7%. Um, during the during 2020 and this of course um, the highest rate since the 1930s and it doesn't even include many of the people who dropped out of the labor force and therefore were no longer counted so some Chicago Fed analysts say that the true unemployment rate in April May was around 30 percent not 14.7 uh, percent so these are some of the economic trends, um, but labor under demand is equally visible in the political phenomena that rising inequality catalyzes, populism, plutocracy, and the rise of a seasteading digital elite, more focused on escaping in rockets to Mars than on improving the lives of the digital peasantry who will be left behind on a burning planet. Both Bezos and Musk, pictured here in a BBC documentary about their space race, um, have, of course, made gigantic fortunes during the corona crisis, even as most Americans continue to worry about their futures. And so pointing with one hand to the homeless and jobless masses of Oakland, California, depicted here on the left, and with the other hand to the robots staffing the Tesla production plant just a few miles away in Fremont, it is easy to believe that the automation theorists must be right. However, as I will argue, the explanation that they offer that runaway technological change is destroying jobs is simply false. There is a persistent um, under demand for labor in the United States and Europe, and even more so in countries like South Africa, India, and Brazil. Yet its cause is almost the exact opposite of the one identified by the automation theorists. Today, I can only take you through a small part of this argument, which is the argument for my book, uh, and talk about some of the consequences as I see them. Um, the book's coming out on November 3rd, and you know, it has some really great virtues. Uh, first of all, um, it's very short, and second of all, it's not very expensive. So you should check it out uh, if you, if you, if you, you know, like what I'm saying. In any case, um, so, I, at the beginning of the book, I, I start off by looking at the manufacturing sector for a few reasons to test out the claims of the automation theorists. First of all, um, manufacturing is the sector most amenable to, to roboticization. Second, as you can see here, we have these measures of the extent to which um, robots have actually been installed in factories. And you can note here, this will be important in a moment, that the United States is not really at the front of the pack here, right? Countries like um, South Korea, Singapore, Germany, and Japan have way more robots per worker in manufacturing compared to the United States. Um, the other reason to look at manufacturing is that according to the automation theorists, this is the sector where the robot apocalypse, um, jo the robot jobs apocalypse has already taken place. And it's certainly true that um, as the automation theorists predict, the world has seen unfolding waves of deindustrialization. Uh, what you can see here, this is the percentage of um, the workforce in different countries that's employed in manufacturing. And you can kind of see these waves of deindustrialization um, depicted by uh, countries like the UK, Italy, South Korea, and even poorer countries that hardly industrialized at all have been deindustrializing. And just because it's commonly asked uh, in this context, you know, what about China? Isn't China this incredible um, manufacturing powerhouse? And of course, it has been. But even China is experiencing deindustrialization. So for now, about seven years, um, the share of the Chinese workforce and in industry um, has been declining. And India had a very slight uptick, but now, again, a very slight downtick. So. Um, what do the numbers show? What's the cause of this trend? What's the cause of deindustrialization across the world? I'll focus on um, three countries just briefly now, uh, Germany, Japan, and the US. 
And these are just the rates of growth of different um, economic indicators. So I'm just starting off here with the numbers on the right. These are the growth of, of employment in manufacturing, different periods in US, German, and Japanese history. And what you can see is that as the automation theory predicts, we see declining rates of employment growth. And already by the 1970s, um, pretty sharp year-on-year -year, uh, declines in um, employment. So that part of the story is true. If this were a story about increasing productivity, if it was a story about replacing human beings with machines and that happening ever faster pace, then we would expect that uh, productivity growth in manufacturing would be rising at a very rapid pace. But when we look at the numbers, we see that productivity growth is, has been steady in the United States, and those numbers are actually contested. We can go into that in the questions if you're interested. Um, but really strongly, if you look at Germany and Japan, two countries which have much more roboticization in manufacturing than the US, we see a pretty significant decline um, in the rate of growth of productivity. So um, if productivity, if rising productivity isn't the cause of the story, what is? I say that um, the real cause is this dramatic fall in the rate of growth of output. This is like the growth of basically the industrial sector of the economy. It was like if you had GDP, but just for industry, um, what you'd see is this pretty sharp decline in the rate of growth of um, the industrial economy. And this is uh, basically the, the real cause, I would say, of deindustrialization, of this decline in manufacturing employment. Note that it isn't that uh, these countries are producing less than they did before. They're producing more, but the rate at which they produce, the rate at which production expands is declining. So we are producing more and more goods with fewer and fewer people but not because, I want to say, not because of a rapid pace of technological change. Rather, this is due to an ever-worsening industrial stagnation. Nor is this happening just in the richest countries of the world. As I said before, it's a global pattern affecting richer and poorer countries alike. And even China is feeling the impact. What's the cause? Well, I can't go into that in a lot of detail today, but just to give you a sense of the argument, um, what I argue based on these numbers from the World Trade Organization, which nicely goes all the way back to the 1950 and has specific data on manufacturing, you can see that overall for the whole world, this includes China, um, there's been a pretty significant decline in the growth of um, manufacturing output or the rate at which the industrial economy expands across the world. And this is due, I think, um, to decades of worsening global industrial overcapacity, which killed the manufacturing growth engine of the economy. So in my view, this isn't just a matter of growing technological capacities of brilliant new technologies on the technological frontier, but also about the replication of technologies across the world, making for ever more crowded um, international markets. Given that the overall rate of growth of the industrial economy is slowing down, no country, no single country can grow quickly except at the expense of others, like China's growth at the ex expense of um, Mexico. And what we see is that this, this pattern in manufacturing then reappears at the level of the economy as a whole. Um, on the left here, you just have the same manufacturing growth rates that I showed you before, but now they're being uh, contrasted to or compared with the growth of the overall economy. So GDP is just the economic growth rate for an individual economy. And what you can see is that as manufacturing slowed down, so too um, did GDP growth. So the economy is growing more slowly. Uh, and looking now at, the, again, the same countries, just going through a few more data points, and, and then we'll talk about you know, more fun and interesting stuff. Um, what we can see is that in a really strong contrast to the theory of automation, um, productivity growth rates, uh, which should be rising very quickly if, um, if there really were this rapid automation, instead productivity growth rates for the economy as a whole are falling. They're of course much lower than in manufacturing, but they don't show any tendency to a radical increase due to um, brilliant new technologies. and um, in a way that's 
very associated with that, uh, capital like firms are just not really investing very much. This is the rate of growth of capital stocks. So like firms investment in equipment and um, buildings and software. And what you see is that that rate of investment has uh, declined over time, period by period in all three of these countries. So, um, so this is kind of the basis in a very telescoped way of my argument that it's slowing growth, not technology induced job destruction that's depressed the global demand for labor. As economic growth decelerates, so too does the rate of job creation. And if we widen our view then with this information from the perspective that the automation theorists are providing, um, they talk about shiny new automated factories and point us to these ping pong playing um, consumer robots on display in trade shows. What we see instead of that um, is a world of crumbling infrastructures, deindustrialized cities, harried nurses, and underpaid salespeople, as well as, importantly, massive stocks of financialized capital with dwindling places to invest themselves profitably. In an effort to revive increasingly stagnant economies, governments have spent almost half a decade imposing austerity on their populations, underfunding schools, hospitals, and public transportation networks and welfare programs. Um, they did this in an effort to uh, get the economy restarted, to revive the economy as it's been slowing down. And at the same time, as part of the same process, governments, businesses, and households have been encouraged to take on record quantities of debts. Um, and they were encouraged to do so by falling interest rates. These trends left the world economy in an incredibly dire state as it faces one of its greatest challenges, the COVID-19 recession. Dilapidated healthcare systems were run overrun with patients, schools closed that were vital sources of basic nutrition for many children, and probably remember that um, in the early moment of the crisis, New York, where it hit very strongly in the US, um, delayed in closing down its schools um, because they were worried about what was going to happen to these children who needed um, the food they were getting at the schools. Um, and meanwhile, the economy is deeply in trouble. In spite of massive monetary and fiscal stimuli, weak economies are unlikely to bounce back quickly from the shock. We know this because um, that's precisely what happened in the past shocks to the economy have been followed by ever more slow and tepid recoveries. And it's for this reason that, in my view, um, predictions of a coming wave of pandemic-induced uh, automation rings so hollow. Although technological change wasn't itself the cause of job loss, at least this time around, automation theorists like Martin Ford and Carl Benedict Frey have argued in um, popular newspapers and magazines that the spread of the pandemic will hasten the transition to a more automated future. This is just one example of an article based on an interview with Martin Ford, um, looking into all the different ways that this is happening. Lost jobs will never return, they say, since cooking, cleaning, recycling, grocery bagging, and caretaking robots, unlike their human counterparts, can neither catch COVID-19 nor transmit it to others. Here, I argue automation theorists have mistaken the techn technological feasibility of widespread automation, which is itself still more of a shaky hypothesis than a proven result for its economic viability. Undeniably, some firms are investing in advanced robotics in response to COVID-19. Walmart really has purchased some self-driving inventory scanning and aisle cleaning robots for its US stores and expecting online ordering to continue to expand exponentially, some retail shops are testing out assisted, uh, robotics-assisted micro-fulfillment centers to help pickers, pickers assemble orders more quickly. However, the use of these technologies will likely remain an exception to the rule for the foreseeable future. With little reason to expect demand to rise strongly following deep recessions, few firms are going to undertake major new investments. Instead, firms will make do with the productive capacities that they already possess, achieving cost savings by shedding labor and speeding up the pace of work for the remaining workers. That is precisely what firms did after the last recession. Too often, commentators simply assume that automation accelerated in the 2010s 
and base their predictions for the future on this false reckoning of the past. In reality, the demand could not be found to justify such investments. Um, in the United States in the 2010s, um, the US saw the lowest rates of capital accumulation and productivity growth in the entire post-war era. And this is just, again, from the Fed, um, they have a beautiful interface for downloading uh, international and national economic statistics. And this is just, um, just their graph of the growth of the capital stock in the US um, since 1950. And you can see this really dramatic fall off in rates of investment uh, since 2010. There's been really very little investment in new um, brilliant technologies in this country. So around the world, um, recessions associated with COVID-19, in spite of the lack of automation, in spite of um, the absence of these new technologies, uh, recessions around, the, around uh, our recessions are leaving legacies of mass unemployment and underemployment from which it will be very difficult to recover. The International Labor Organization, the UN um, Labor Agency, estimated that in the first few months of the crisis, 14% of work hours were lost worldwide, equivalent to 400 million jobs out of a global labor force of 3.5 billion people. And long unfolding transformations in work amplified this pandemic shakeout. Over the past half century, service work has come to account for 75 to 80% of work in high income countries like the US and in European countries, um, and 50% of employment worldwide. Recessions usually affect services least of all. Unlike spending on consumer durables, such as cars and computers, spending on services usually remains buoyant during a downturn. But as economist Gabriel Mathy has recently argued, pandemic lockdowns had the opposite effect, hitting services the hardest. As spending on services collapsed and with it the incomes of many workers, a decline in consumer demand reverberated through the economy with lasting consequences for workers worldwide. The destruction of work, um, as has been noted in a number of recent um, uh, international institutional reports, the destruction of work has been particularly bad for women who are overrepresented in activities such as retail trade that the lockdowns hit the hardest. Women are also overrepresented among uh, frontline healthcare workers too, and they have undoubtedly been forced to undertake the majority of the increase in unpaid care work demanded by the pandemic, not only taking care of the sick and dying, but also minding the more than 1 billion children who were kept out of school. Um, when, the, when the lockdown started. The transition to a majority service work world, um, which has accompanied this story I was telling earlier about deindustrialization and um, the, that one effect of that was to massively push all these workers into services. Um, the transition to a majority service work world, which was already ongoing, then amplified the pandemic's destructive consequences. And I argue it will now slow the pace of the recovery. As economist William Baumol explained in the 1960s, services are in large part a stagnant economic sector. Unlike manufacturing during its heyday, services generally do not exhibit dynamic patterns of growth um, driven by high rates of labor productivity and falling prices. Instead, the demand for services generally depends on spillover effects from productivity enhancing innovations occurring in other economic sectors. So here, um, you know, one thing I do in my work is I, I like to look at statistics, not only from rich countries, but also comparatively across um, different world regions. And here, um, what I'm showing you is just, again, um, about how slow productivity growth is in the rest of the economy. These are uh, three countries, Thailand, South Africa, and Mexico, where you can see that uh, in their service sectors, almost all, and in some cases more than all, of the growth of um, output has been accounted for by rising employment. In a place like Mexico, where you have negative productivity growth, that's because so many people are being added to these sectors, just kind of in make work, um, that the effect of their addition to the labor force has lowered the overall efficiency of um, service production. And so um, following on Baumol, I say that there's this clear link between the global expansion of the stagnant service sector and the worsening stagnation 
of the wider economy. After the onset of deindustrialization, which began in the United States and the United Kingdom in the late 1960s, and then came to infect much of the rest of the world in the decades that followed, after that, no sector has proven to be an adequate replacement. With the running down of the formerly robust industrial growth engine, the global economy has increasingly been left without a driver. And despite this weakening of the global economic growth engine, workers losing their jobs uh, during the pandemic are still going to have to find some way to survive um, in the pandemic and you know, whenever it emerges the post-pandemic era. Over time, unemployment will uh, eventually resolve, therefore, into various forms of underemployment. In other words, workers will find that they have no choice but to take jobs offering lower than normal wages or worse than normal working conditions, much as they did after in the aftermath of past recessions. Those who can't find any work at all will set up shop in the global informal sector or else will drop out of the labor force entirely. As was the case following past recessions, the vast majority of the world's underemployed workers will end up in low wage jobs in services. And services that see persistently low rates of productivity growth and pay low wages have now for decades served as the premier site of job creation in stagnant economies. Um, part of the reason for that is that workers' wages make up a relatively large share of the final price of, of these services um, as paid by consumers. And that makes it possible for service-based firms to raise the demand for their products by holding down workers' wages relative to whatever increases in productivity um, are occurring in the wider economy. So this is this kind of process of immiserating growth or immiserating job creation where workers' wages have to be held down um, in order to, uh, to, to, to stoke job creation. And a really extreme version of this on the world scale is that uh, you see this in small scale family operations that comprise the world's massive informal labor force. Um, they use a similar strategy to compete with highly capitalized firms, compressing their own household wages as much as possible to make a little space for themselves in the economy. And the effect of this situation in which the economy is running down um, with the depletion of the industrial growth engine. Workers are only finding jobs, or many workers, not all, but many workers are finding jobs in these um, low wage sectors, is that inequality is intensifying. Um, as economists David Autor and Anna Salmons have noted, quote, labor displacement needs not imply a decline in employment, hours, or wages. It can also hide itself in the relative immiseration of the working class as, quote, the wage bill that is the product of hours and wages per hour rises less rapidly than does value added. And that's just to say that there's this general process of um, well known in the case of the US, there's a famous graph from the EPI showing this divergence between productivity growth, um, which continues to rise, albeit more slowly and um, the growth of wages for pro production and non-supervisory workers. This gap between productivity and wages has opened up across the OECD. So um, as is less well known, even in countries like um, uh, Germany, especially you know, Israel, Ireland, Slovakia, you can see this kind of set of countries at the bottom of this chart, but all, all throughout the OECD, you see the widening gap between the growth of real wages and especially the real median wage, so the, the wage of the 50th percentile worker, there's a real gap opening up between their wages and labor productivity growth. And as that gap grows, um, the labor share of income, the share of all income that's going to workers uh, is falling. Worldwide, the labor share of income fell by five percentage points between 1980 and the mid-2000s as a growing portion of income growth was captured by wealthy asset holders. So this is just a, a bunch of um, data about the world and an alternative explanation in which it's not rapidly rising um, productivity growth associated with breakout and breakthrough technologies but rather this ever worsening stagnation of the economy that's responsible for people not being able to find work. And when they do find work, finding that their, um, their bargaining power and their autonomy at work is being depleted. Um, life in stagnant economies 
has therefore come to be defined by an intense employment insecurity, which is all the worse in recession years like 2020, which has been artfully represented in recent science fiction dystopias like Time Out, Children of Men, and Ready Player One, populated by a redundant humanity. I don't know if anyone has seen this. There's also this great, um, at least the first season was great. I didn't watch the second one. Uh, series on that's on Netflix, a Brazilian show called The 3%. Um, where members of the favelas compete for places in a very tiny uh, meritocracy. So most people are scraping by, earning additional minutes of life one at a time, while the richest asset owners have amassed such large quantities of capital that they are endowed with a monetary equivalent of immortality. In my view, it's precisely for this reason that it's actually so important to reflect on today's automation discourse not only to combat its mistaken explanation for chronic labor under demand, but also to inspire efforts to resolve the world's chronic labor problems in a utopian direction. In a world reeling from a global pandemic, rising inequality, recalcitrant neoliberalism, resurgent ethno-nationalism, and climate change, uh, automation theorists have inspired people with a vision of the future in which humanity advances to the next stage in its history, whatever we might take that to mean, and technology helps to free us all to discover and follow our passions. As with many of the utopias of the past, these visions need to be freed from their authors' technological and technocratic fantasies as, as to how constructive social change might take place. I argue that we can achieve the post-scarcity world that the automation theorists evoke, even if the automation of production proves impossible. At stake is the question of what achieving an economy of abundance actually entails. So to imagine the shift from the, the, the fellow world to the world um, that the automation theorists invoke. This is a, a famous Bruegel painting of um, Cocaine, the, the land of, um, of abundance of the you know, peasant fantasy of the mid, mid um, uh, the, the, the early modern period. So, according to the automation discourse, abundance is a technological threshold that we will one day cross uh, with brilliant new technologies. I think we should understand abundance differently, not as a technological overcoming, but as a social relationship that we can put into practice without needing more technological breakthroughs and while remaining within the bounds of ecological sustainability. To live in a world of abundance, I think, means to live in a world where everyone is guaranteed access to housing, food, clothing, sanitation, water, energy, healthcare, education, child and elder care, and means of, of communication and transportation without exception. The steadfast material security implied by such a principle is what would allow people to ask, as they do in the science fiction fantasies of automation theorists, what am I going to do with the time of my life rather than how am I going to keep on living? Instead of waiting around for a technological fix, we can get to this world of abundance by cooperatively taking on the work that we have to do that remains necessary for our lives and that cannot be automated away. And it is of course more urgent to do so now than at any time in the past. In the midst of the COVID-19 recession and facing a much larger climate crisis in the years to come, we have to inaugurate the kind of post-scarcity world that the automation theorists discuss by providing every human being with access to the basic goods and services that they need to make a life, regardless of their labor contributions. Achieving this world of, of abundance will require reorganizing production. That's something that Harvard economist Danny Roderick has recently been arguing in the midst of the corona crisis, but I would argue that he doesn't go far enough in envisioning such a reorganization. Today, people have little say in how their work is done. Many people show up to work each day only because they would starve if they didn't. In a world where people's needs were guaranteed to be met, work would have to be democratized. Sharing out the work to be done while making allowances for aptitudes and abilities would lessen the amount of necessary labor demanded of any one individual while also ensuring that everyone had ample free time. Anti-racist theorist W.E.B. Du Bois once estimated that in quote, the future industrial democracy, just three to six hours of necessary labor per day would suffice, leaving abundant time for leisure, exercise, study, and avocations. 
Instead of making some engage in menial service so that others might make art, he said we would all be artists and all serve. And there's, of course, resonances between this vision and the vision of someone like John Maynard Keynes in his famous text on the economic possibilities of our grandchildren. The pathway to a post-scarcity world is currently blocked by a tiny class of ultra-wealthy individuals who monopolize decisions about investment and employment and have little interest in democratizing the economy. For 40 years or 50 years, this tiny elite has used the threat of disinvesting from an already fragile economy to force political parties and trade unions to capitulate to their demands for looser business regulations, laxer labor laws, slower growing wages, and in the midst of economic crises for private bailouts and public austerity. And all of these have been sold to the public under the, 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 the slogan or the, in the call that we need to do this to revive the growth engine. And of course, as I've been showing you, these efforts have failed so far. In, insofar as sections of um, the wealthy elite, particularly in Silicon Valley, feign support for proposals like universal basic income or UBI, which does begin to point towards this kind of transformation um, toward a world in which people um, can meet their needs, um, regardless of their situation. Um, insofar as Silicon Valley elites feign support for proposals like that, it is only because UBI doesn't threaten elite control over the levers of investment and employment. For UBI to serve as a pathway to a post-scarcity economy, the automation theorist analysis really would need to be correct. Today's low demand for labor would have to originate in a rapid automation of production. Were that the case, the main issue society would confront would be one of reorganizing distribution with rising economic uh, inequality rectified by distributing more and more income as UBI payments. If instead, as I have argued, labor under demand is a result of global overcapacity and depressed investment, driving down rates of economic growth, then such a distributional struggle would quickly become a zero sum conflict, blocking progress towards a freer future. Given the opposition of elites who retain the power to throw the economy into chaos by disinvestment, we will have to get to the economy of abundance through some other means, through social movements and struggles that seek to transform production itself. Large numbers of people are already fighting against the symptoms of a long-term decline in the demand for labor, which include rising inequality, employment insecurity, austerity measures, and police murders of poor and racialized communities. Over the past 10 years, we've seen waves of strikes and demonstrations across six continents, and especially strongly in 2019, right before the coronavirus hit, um, from China and Hong Kong to Iraq and Lebanon, from Argentina and Chile to France and Greece, and from Australia to Indonesia and the United States and protests have recently resurged, of course, in the US in 2020. I would say that we need to immerse ourselves in the movements that are born of these um, struggles, helping to drive them forward toward a better world um, in which the infrastructures of our societies are brought under more democratic collective control, work is reorganized and redistributed, scarcity is overcome through the free giving of necessary goods and services, and our human capacities are correspondingly enlarged as new vistas of existential security and freedom open up. Only highly organized movements that cohere internally and among each other would be able to complete this task to synthesize as, uh, or to break through, as the automation theorists say, um, to a new synthesis of what it means to be a human being, to live in a world devoid of poverty and billionaires, of stateless refugees and detention camps, and of lives spent in drudgery, which hardly offer a moment to rest, let alone to dream. It's true that if movements fighting for a better world fail, the best we might get would be something like a modest UBI, which um, governments are now testing out as a possible response to the coronavirus recession. But I would say that we shouldn't be fighting for this limited goal, but rather to inaugurate a more sustainable post-scarcity planet. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm going to hand it over now um, to Anne. Thank you. So um, thank you so much. That was um, really an uh, interesting talk. And I, um, I admire the, the, the 
kind of large scale of your talk. I, I feel I have to say that I approach this um, and my thinking about some of this, uh, not just as an economist, but I think importantly as a microeconomist. And so I spend a lot of my time thinking about individual worker behaviors and responses. And I think it's interesting to bring that to this uh, much broader sweeping vision that's looking into the future to think about how those, those internal responses might maybe inform the story or maybe change it. So I'll come back to that. Um, when I thought about the responding to, to the overall topic, the question for me was really thinking about, does the future of work include work? And I, you know, I completely agree with much that you've said. I, I myself find that the, the automation theorist may have skipped a few steps and perhaps um, gotten a few details wrong. Um, I always like, when I think about this, I always think of, uh, as sort of a metaphor for some of the missing links, I think of the story of self-driving trucks. Because from, a, from an economist view, we've heard a lot in recent years about self-driving trucks and how um, there's all sorts of, um, they're both exciting, but also there's a lot of uh, scary stuff raised that all of the, this class of workers who drive trucks, who move goods around the country, or going to be out of a job. I think that the devil, as they say, is in the details, because if you look today uh, into the trucking industry, prior to COVID, of course, but the main thing you would see is a, a really acute shortage and upward pressure on the wages of truck drivers. And to me, this is just an example of the, a little bit of the clash between these long-term stories or theories we have and the transition path or what happens in the meantime. We clearly are not at a point where trucking companies are so secure that they're soon gonna not need workers that they are converting or planning to convert because right now the crisis, the day-to-day -day crisis is we need to raise wages and we're always out there beating the bushes looking for truck drivers. So that's kind of my, um, one of the ways I think about bringing the, the immediate steps that have to happen in contrast to the bigger, the bigger vision of some of these automation stories. So I wanted to say, just make a few points about how I see the, the microeconomic underpinnings of some of these transitions and stories. And, let me first say a little bit, um, you very nicely tied this long sweep with our current situation um, in the COVID recession we're facing. And so I wanted to, to start there and then say a little bit about both how I see workers responding to some of the current circumstances and then how I see in particular here US policy responding. So first to think about the COVID recession, I, I guess I would, I would argue a bit with the storyline that the COVID recession is a bit of an intensification or an acceleration of a long run uh, kind of downward spiral we're in. I think it's true that we have had a series of recessions. Um, the last one had a particularly slow recovery. Um, the, on the other hand, we have had a period where we have long, increasingly long periods of pretty stable uh, growing economies in between those recessions. Now, that gets into the issue of what we mean by stable and growing, and I think you have to worry about whether you're thinking of growth at all parts of the wage distribution or just at the medium, and that's a, I think that's a reasonable point, but I would point to the fact not to sound in any way similar to certain political leaders we might know that the US did have a very strong economy for not all, but many segments of the workplace before we hit COVID. So then COVID hits and here to me, I can't emphasize enough how unique the COVID recession is when we think about past experiences. And 
for economists in particular, I think it's unique because for once, I think the community of economists can all agree on what caused this recession. I mean, it was a very, it was a very clear event. It, it made us finally recognize that economic activity requires us to be able to be out, to be together, to interact as humans. And when that's not possible, a lot of economic activity gets shut down. I think your point about, um, I think the way you put it was that the, the increasing focus of the economy on the service sector made the COVID recession really um, quite severe. And I think that's right. I guess the way I think of it is that this, you know, COVID in many ways has exposed some uh, true vulnerabilities of our economy, of our society, and, and perhaps the, the way it has hit the service sector is one of those. And, and so I, I take and, and would agree with that point. The thing I might disagree with, though, in terms of thinking about whether the shift to a, a largely service-driven economy uh, is, a, is a story of, of decline, I think we want to be careful about what, what we mean by the service economy. I think one of the things that struck me about the current recession is it, it really has um, focused on another type of inequality, and that is that men, many of us, in particular, highly educated workers whose work is about thinking or symbols or uh, cognitive work have been very insulated from the economic effects. I think all of us as academics sort of recognize that. That's one form of, of service. I think there are many uh, highly educated service workers who have been um, largely untouched in a way by this recession. And I think it's just a note to be a little careful what we mean when we talk about the service sector, because of course, it's a whole range of, of activities, some of which were deeply impacted by COVID and perhaps by these longer run trends and others that I'm not so sure that's true of. Um, the, the last thing I'll mention um, is I, I do, I appreciated the, the figures you showed early on about um, changes in output and in productivity over time. And I think you're, I think you're absolutely right that those make the story the simple story of automation really difficult. I do think though it's important that to recognize that another aspect of the economy shifting to being driven largely by a service sector is it does create a real challenge for measuring productivity and output. And as we've shifted from manufacturing to services, it has to be true that measuring output has gotten much more difficult. And in my reading of work by economists here is that I don't think anyone believes that all of the productivity slowdown we're seeing is due to mismeasurement, but I think there's a good case to be made that some of it almost certainly must be. It's just not as easy to measure output in the service sector as in the manufacturing. So now let me focus on the, the two main points that I, I wanted to just think about in terms of how we might see economies, people, and governments responding really post-COVID, but as we continue some of these trends. And the first point I want to make is I think something you got to later in the talk that's really important is I think we always have to think about how workers respond to the evolution of their wages. And one thing that is, is not well recognized, and I'm sure to, to the many non-economists listening, this may sound a little bit like economist semantics, but I want to distinguish between a reduction in demand that simply says there are no jobs, so we're going to have more unemployment or underemployment, versus a reduction in demand that lowers the wage and then causes large numbers of workers to say, I'm not going to work at this wage. And the reason I argue it's not semantics is because if you think about what might reverse that, one, one thing would be, well, if we can find ways to subsidize the wage, 
we may actually be able to move rates of employment because of the labor supply response. And so some of my work, for example, has tried to look at the incredible growth in the US of the number of what we call prime age men in the US economy who have, have uh, experienced zero hours of work over a period of at least a year. Those numbers have risen pretty steadily over several decades. And what we haven't really um, done a very good job of measuring though is to understand how different would that have looked if we could have effectively subsidized or otherwise raised the wage. And so my estimates, which are consistent with some work other economists have done, are that for, um, for men in this country with, uh, without a college education, maybe something like 30 to 40% of this observed non-employment can be attributed to the level of wages. And so that's gonna, I'm gonna come back to that when I talk about what I see as kind of local US policy responses. Um, but the bottom line here is that I think, you know, it's not to say that, that men who drop out of the labor force because their wages are too low are living kind of a high life or are perhaps, um, you know, uh, living a life of abundance with lots of leisure. But it is a, a little bit of a warning that we have to think about how workers might respond. I think in particular, you can get workers responding to wages either overall or in one sector in interesting ways. So um, if, if, if we are, instead of just thinking that demand has been reduced and so we're not seeing as much employment as, as we might like, or, or perhaps that's a good thing, I think you wanna think carefully about how workers respond and what their alternatives are. Another way this comes up is if you think about automation again, automation, is not going to apply equally across sectors. And so you may get interesting outcomes where you have workers shifting across sectors um, rather than simply leaving the labor force. And I think that's always something to keep in mind. And this gets back a little bit to the truck drivers. Um, perhaps there's a transition path as we, as we do automate some sectors where they won't be truck drivers, but perhaps they will be um, highly technical driverless truck mechanics or making those sorts of shifts. The last point I want to make, I, have, I, have, I feel like I have lots more to say, but I want to give time for audience questions, is I wanted to say a little bit to come back to the arguments about the universal basic income. Because the, the, the problem that many economists have with universal basic income is that it turns out to be a pretty expensive way to transfer resources in the sense that it's universal, so it isn't targeted. I think over time, we've learned a lot more about other policies and ways that we can effectively subsidize the wage and encourage work. And so I, I mentioned wage subsidies, which are actually something that there was a lot of experimentation with in the, in the 2008 recession and some pretty interesting results that showed that rather than uh, thinking about um, traditional unemployment insurance or, or welfare programs, policies that recognize that for many sectors, wages are just too low, you can subsidize the wage and workers do in fact choose to work. Well, that I know can be a loaded expression when you say workers choose to work at a, a relatively low wage. And here, when I think about it, I think there is also something to be said for what I view as a consensus in the US over the past 20 years, that for reasons you can, you can argue whether they're good or bad, but there is a sort of cultural and political agreement that there are some, there are reasons that many individuals want to work. There's a sociologist, Catherine Eden, has written about the fact that many recipients of the earned income tax credit talk about liking it because they feel incorporated into society when they are working and getting what's effectively a wage subsidy as opposed to getting a welfare check. Um, 
you know, we were seeing before COVID an expansion of some pretty, uh, pretty large minimum wage increases that economists were arguing about, but were increasingly embraced. I thought I was seeing the beginnings of movements to address some of the negative aspects of low wage service employment, uh, scheduling irregularities, uh, lack of job security. And why was that happening? I think it was happening because firms were recognizing that if they didn't change these policies, they weren't going to have access to a workforce that they really needed. And so again, gets back to the fact that despite enough automation, for some parts of production, we really do need workers. There are reasons that some workers would choose that over uh, not working and receiving a transfer payment. Um, I feel like there's, there's much more to say, but I will wrap up. I think I agree that automation has been a little perhaps overblown or its consequences. Uh, at the same time, I think there are forces that push back and will tend, at least in a sort of uh, developed country like the US, to push on how to solve a problem of low wages that does keep workers attached to jobs. And um, we, of course, will have to get beyond uh, COVID and our lack of being able to interact with one another to see if those have, have more legs that will get us there. I will stop there, thank you. Thank you both um, for terrific uh, presentation, Erin, and, um, and very provocative comments. So, um, I, Erin, do you want to take a few moments to respond before we open it up? Sure. So, um, thank you, Anne, for those comments. I mean, I, you know, I love talking um, to people about this stuff, especially people who have some real, um, you know, knowledge and, and skills beyond um, what I have in the, in the economics field. Um, and I think it, it is interesting to think about these issues around how, um, you know, often the, the stories about automation, it's very hard to tell what's going on because sometimes we just hear about like, incredible changes that the self-driving trucks were, they seemed like they were about to roll out four years ago and then somehow we just stopped hearing about them and we still haven't seen them um, really on the road. And so finding the, you know, the balance there about what's happening, I think is very difficult. I guess one of my concerns, and I feel like it's been very interesting to watch the changes in the economics profession recently is that I, I do think that um, economists have had a, a standard response to the automation story, which is that um, which is that as much as jobs are being you know destroyed through technological change, new jobs are also created on the other side. And so that on balance, um, creative destruction has been this giant, you know, an engine of the economy. Um, and I think I would push you a little bit on what you were saying about how you think that, you know, by different measures, like the economy hasn't really been doing that bad or wasn't doing that bad recently. Um, I think if you just look at the average growth rate, peak to peak or trough to trough, you'll just see like the economy's just been growing more and more slowly business cycle by business cycle since the 90s. Um, it grew half as fast in the last cycle as it did in um, the 90s, which was the fastest that the US economy had grown, particularly in the second half of the, of, the, of the 90s, in a very long time. And that, you know, excluding that very exceptional period, you see a real long term trend of slowdown. And what that means is that, like, as those jobs are being destroyed by technological change, even though it's much weaker than it was in the past, um, new jobs, I think, really aren't being created. And I think that that trend, which is being rec recognized now, very belatedly, in my view, um, as secular stagnation, right? That's, that's a really important um, part of the story. And I just don't, personally, I don't believe that that trend can be, I think there's a number of things that have been offered, like intangibles, that somehow there's all of this, 
um, investment that's taking place that can't really be seen because it's in these um, intangibles that can't really be measured. Um, claims that have been going on since the 90s that this is about um, mismeasurement and services, which of course there is. And I think when the trend started, it made sense to say, oh, well, you know, maybe things are off by 10% because of measurement issues. But when things have gotten so extreme over time, I'm not even talking about Corona, I'm just talking about, um, you know, the decade after the Great Recession, they've gotten bad enough that I, I just don't think that the statistical issues, they would have to be off by so much um, for that to be right. So I think that there is a real trend. And I also think, you know, if you look at it comparatively, like Japan and Germany didn't have a 90s boost. They, they just declined straight through from the 70s until recently. They've been doing a little bit better um, since 2000, especially compared to the US. Um, but I think, I think a lot of that has to do with currency uh, valuation changes. Like on the whole, you're just seeing um, these trends unfold across countries in a way that I think is, it, it makes it hard to hold up a story of in which more or less like things declining here kind of are explained by things rising elsewhere in the economy. And I think Larry Summers recently coming out and just saying, look, you know, we have a long-term story here. We were advocating um, a whole set of policies, especially in Europe around labor market activation, all different kinds of ways to try to get people back to work. But in the face of stagnation, those things mostly meant that people faced more hardship and had fewer state resources to rely on um, facing a tougher job market. I disagree with him about the explanation of that because I think his story is much more demand-driven and driven by um, savings gluts and so on. Whereas I guess I agree with the critics of Keynesianism in various ways, this is a much more structural problem. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think that those, yeah, I think, I guess that's part of what I'm interested in, in talking about. And I think those disagreements are important and um, that there's a lot of reasons to disagree and there's a lot of different perspectives on that issue. What I totally agree with you about is that um, I don't think it's enough to give people money and tell them that they can just, you know, that I don't think that that responds to the needs people have. I do think that economists tend to sometimes underplay the importance of universal benefits because I think that those serve a political and Republican role that is that really outweighs their economic role. There's, there's a real importance to universal benefits and maybe part of what needs to happen is to think more about how means tested benefits in the US have a racist history. And there's a lot of reasons why a really sort of anti poor policy in this country has been reflected in a stronger reliance on means tested rather than universal benefits. So I think that the call for UBI in the US has a particularly important political and Republican in the small r sense significance in this country. But I totally agree on the whole. I mean, as someone who studies unemployment, going way back to the mid 20th century, when people said, look, you know, just giving people even unemployment payments and letting them just suffer outside the economy and feel useless. Um, a lot of people in the mid 20th century saw that already as a huge source of, um, you know, the mid 20th century's version of populism, all of these kind of right wing movements um, attributing that not only to unemployment, but to the fact that people, um, even if they had an income, even if they received unemployment benefits, that they felt useless and left out of the world of work. And so I'm also really interested in questions about um, how, how we can live in a world where people actually do feel like they have purposeful and meaningful work. And I think it's also really interesting to think about how the economics profession is like, what it means to think of work as a disutility and how that, you know, what, what that means about the ability to think within an economic lens about how people actually enjoy some kinds of work more than others and, and the, yeah, how that, how that affects how we, should, how we should think about that. So those are just some initial comments. I'm so, I think this is a, a really important conversation and I'm so excited um, to be having it. So I'll stop there and we can get some, some comments.
All right, great. I see that the chat is starting. Um, so uh, just a couple of things. So first of all, everyone should feel free to turn on their cameras. Um, if you're a student in the class, then you should definitely turn them on. Um, and generally, we have the students ask the first couple of questions. Um, and I'm, yeah, I think we'll, sh well, actually, because Jamie Galbraith has a specific um, intervention on what you all were just talking about in terms of productivity and growth measurement, I'm going to break that rule and let him go ahead of the students, but then the students are next. Um, and uh, just one other way to make this sort of more conversational, if you have a comment that's on point with something that someone else has raised, um, we used to ask you to put up two fingers. Um, you could just put into the chat that you wanna follow up um, on somebody else's comment. I think that might be the easiest way to do it. And um, so that we can try to have a conversation going and you'll get a little bit of priority if you do that in the same way that I'm letting um, Professor Galbraith jump in now. Um, okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, uh, let me just say from the to start that I found myself in very broad agreement with your conclusions. Uh, however, on some of the analytical points that got you there, I have some reservations and I want to make a couple of those uh, uh, observations. The first has to do with the with this notion that uh, when you have uh, slow productivity growth, uh, that that is a, um, uh, that that shows up in the, uh, uh, that that as as that's a failure of technological change. Uh, the underlying thought there is that productivity growth is largely labor saving, so you have a gap between output and uh, and and employment that develops, and you're not seeing that. But in this case, with the kinds of productivity growth that we're seeing, uh, which has a lot to do with the nature of the of, of digital automation, are highly capital saving, uh, and they're going to reduce. They, they, the, what it has to be spent on investment, they reduce bricks and mortar invest, brick and mortar investment, construction investment in the country. Uh, they reduce the cost of capital equipment because this stuff is really, the prices fall very, very rapidly. And they also don't add to GDP because they're largely imported rather than produced at home. So for all these reasons, with even more rapid technical change, you can still see a slower growth rate. Uh, and slower and an absence of measured productivity growth. I don't think they can, the, the productivity growth measure that we have been using, it seems to me, is thoroughly out of date from that point of view. Uh, so again, I think that, that nexus, using productivity as a measure of technical change uh, is, is, is not really uh, useful at, at, in the way, world we're living in now. I say this to you as we, we look upon, uh, talk to each other over Zoom, uh, uh, which is costing us absolutely nothing and adding nothing to the economy, but what nobody would say uh, that it's not a, uh, an element of, or result of, of a technological change. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point has to do with uh, the nature of the service jobs. And you, you, you basically expressed that they were jobs that are, were low grade. They're not terribly well paid, but I would argue that the kind of jo service job creation that we've seen, particularly in the last 30 years, but especially since the last Great Recession, were largely uh, jobs that provide services of, uh, that are essentially upper income service, services of a wealthy society. You can see this all around any city in the United States, whether you have restaurants, bars, cafes, uh, uh, gyms, uh, all these things cropping up that provided, uh, uh, that provided the employment. Uh, that grew and they rather remarkably in the last 12 years since the great crisis. Uh, the difficulty here is not that these are low jo jobs of a, of, a, of a declining society. They're jobs of a wealthy society, but they're easily replaced, easily, easily foregone. Uh, we all, particularly upper income people, middle income people, have houses to retreat to. We don't need to go out to eat. We don't need to go out to drink. We can, we can communicate over the, over, over the broadband that's available to us. We were being induced to substitute service market activity for home activity after having built up large stocks of capital at home capital, if you like. Of, uh, and now we can retreat to them. And those jobs don't come back uh, 
very easily, not only because of the public health problem that they're, as uh, Dean Stevens said, that they're, they require personal interaction in order to be viable. And you can't do that as long as the public health issue is there. But also because when the public health issue goes away, people are going to be in a state of great uncertainty about what, the, what their economic future is. And as a result of that, whatever financial resources they have, they're going to be saving them. And so they are going to continue not to provide the demand for each other's taking in each other's washing and scratching each other's backs, which we've been doing effectively to provide each other jobs for the last, well, 30 years, but especially the last 12. And so I think that for that reason, it's all the more important that you come to your conclusion that there's going to have to be an organization of the provision of the basic uh, needs uh, and wants of the society. And then that will have to be done on a cooperative basis. And I know that in Germany, there is some effort going on at, to provide, for example, part of the fixed costs of service establishments at the, the municipality of Berlin has been doing that with, uh, uh, with a great many of its, of, of its independent uh, self-employed people. Um, and we're going to have to think about how to do that or those jobs simply won't return because people not having a job are not going to be demanding the services that other people will provide, and those people won't have jobs either. So that strikes me as a, as, as a stronger basis for your argument uh, that things are not going to return to what they were and that we need to reorganize the society. That argument, I find, is completely correct, and I agree with it. Thank you. Um, do you want to just very briefly respond, Aaron, and then uh, we'll get a few more issues on the table. <laughs> sure. Um, I think it would be impossible to respond quickly to, <laughs> to those questions. But... Um, and do it over the course of the next... Um, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I'll just say very briefly that um, I don't necessarily think that there's a failure of technical change. Um, because I think that in contrast to someone like Robert Gordon, who really thinks we've run out of steam. Um, I do think what he says about measurement issues is really important that the kind of things people say about how there's all this unmeasured productivity growth today is actually more true of things like the transition from a rural to an urban world where people have indoor plumbing and a whole range of things that um, massively improve the quality of their life but weren't really included in the statistics, I find his critique of the, the measurement story um, very compelling, but I find his account of like the end of technological change uncompelling because I guess in a certain way, um, I think that sort of in line with Caldor's growth laws that what we're really talking about is a story where slower growth means slower rates of investment and accumulation. And that in turn actually is the cause of slower rates of productivity growth rather than um, the reverse. I definitely think it's true. I would, I don't think that we, we clearly live in a very wealthy society. That wealth is very unequally distributed and in the, in the income is as well. And I think there's a lot of people who are very poor and who don't have, um, who don't live the kind of life um, maybe exactly that was described there, especially in a country that has so little access to um, childcare where a lot of young people are foregoing having children because they don't have access to those kinds of essential services with the incomes that they earn. But um, beyond that, I, I just think that part of the issue here is that it's very hard to map a story about the United States, a very wealthy economy creating jobs for those reasons onto all these other countries in the world that are also experiencing much slower growth and experience a similar creation of um, similar transition to low wage services and a similar kind of experience of, um, you know, in their case called premature deindustrialization, a premature transition to the services world, um, but are experiencing very similar kinds of changes. I feel like it's, it's difficult to transmit a kind of um, a story about changing demand with the increasing wealth of society outside of the US context to other places. So I'll just start there. And then, of course, we can um, keep the conversation going. I'll just say that as a student of Nikki Calder's, I'm always appreciative of any reference to his work. <laughs> Michelle, do you want to 
Yes, so we've got a question here um, from John, and he actually has requested to speak as well. And his question is about defining work, um, if we are subsidizing it versus universal work. Uh, John, if you want to go ahead and elaborate on your question. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, OK, so my question is that about returning to the, the conversation of universal basic income versus some other policy prescriptions. Uh, such as what was mentioned in work subsidies, um, which I think is compelling because it brings up the, a conversation about the legal definitions of work. Um, a quote that I, really resonated with me that I read recently from Michael Denning um, is, to speak of labor is to speak of the already enfranchised. Um, so Dr. Beninov, in your most recent article, I think, which is unpublished still, you cite that 70% of workers in the global south are defined as informal. Uh, and during the first months of the pandemic, 1.6 billion workers lost 60% of their income. So informality thereby is, is this institutionalized instability. Uh, they have nothing to fall back on. And furthermore, you argue that this is exactly what we're starting to see in the global north. So uh, work everywhere is evolving into this legal liminal space, you, you say, between employment and unemployment, formal and informal work. And you bring in the term underemployment to characterize this new standard of work. So my question is, if, uh, if we continue to rely on worker status in order to provide for people to make sure they have enough food um, and to make sure they live with a measure of justice and equality, if we continue to rely on defining work and having people do that work, uh, is it time for a new legal definition of what work is? Um, or then alternatively do UBI policy proposals sort of uh, eliminate the need to, to define work in this way. Um, and the question is really for both speakers. Thank you all for your time. Great. Um, do you, just for the, for my understanding of the organization, do you want me to respond to each question or do you want to take a bunch of questions or how do you want to uh, organize it? You know, we're pretty good on time right now. So I think we can, especially, right. That was raised for both of you and and might have some comments on the last question too so um and i think it's a good segue to the next one um so anyway i would say go ahead and and respond perfect well thank you for that john i also read your um a short kind of uh piece that you wrote around reading my work so i i know that you're um you've you've really uh taken it in and i appreciate that um Around questions of legal definition of work, I think we're seeing this happen right now. It's been really interesting to watch. Um, I know Anne's from, or was, was in California until recently, and watching the fight around AB um, 22. Sorry, now we're getting into very late time in Berlin, so my memory might not be working. But the, um, the law uh, or the um, proposal to change the definition of work to include workers at places like Uber um, as being employees and therefore being entitled to the kinds of legal benefits of employees. And I think that this is a really interesting feature of the present moment and of struggles around the definition of work, um, which are going to have broad effects on how we think about what counts of, as work on the one side as far as um, legal definitions and protections and I think if you look at the European scene, you'll see that um, things have generally been moving in the other direction. There's been a lot of effort to reduce workers' employment protections, especially for temporary workers. And there have been many kind of breakout um, big social movements in a number of countries trying to fight over these questions of the legal definition and spaces of work and who um, has rights to do what. Uh, and I think that's going to be really important. And I would give a shout out to Vina uh, Duval, who has written about this, especially around the Uber case. Uh, her work from a legal perspective, she's at Hastings, a uh, law professor, is particularly interesting. I would just also mention that, you know, I think there's another conversation about what's beyond work, right? And what it is that we should think about as um, what's the other side of work and is the other side of work leisure? Um, that seems to me, I mean, Anne raised this point, and I think it's a really interesting um, point about what are these people who are these needs, these neither in employment, education, or training, what, what are they doing, 
Are there lives, um, you know, is that leisure? In many cases, not. It's like a pretty horrible life. Um, but, you know, it, it's like, we don't, there's a great quote from, I don't think it's William Beveridge, but I, I think it might even be the League of Nations very final report before it was translated into the UN where they said, we shouldn't want, we shouldn't let um, the current situation of unwanted leisure, like kind of um, uh, blind us to the need to create a world of wanted leisure and to think about what people will want to do at that time. There's been a lot of work, a uh, talk about post work or what people do outside of their uh, working time. And I guess I'm interested in thinking about a whole range of activities that people engage in that seem to break the work divide, uh, sorry, the, the work leisure divide in different ways. On the one hand, there's a negative version of that, like the needs or the incels and the kind of life that they're leading outside of work. That's a kind of negative version of the story. There's also very positive stories about what people um, do with their time and the kind of passionate hobbies, Keynes thought, um, science fiction writers think about all kinds of other things that people would do in a world where they didn't have to work, but would still find themselves passionately engaged in transforming the world um, in different ways. So I'll stop there. So I think it's really, you, you kind of touch on an issue that I was trying to, to be a little careful as I was speaking, because I think there is a there is a whole very gray area where I might talk about, you know, the sociology that says many individuals want to work. They want, in a sense, the dignity of work. But I think you have to be really careful about what you mean by work when you make that claim, because there is certainly, it's a very, uh, you know, privileged uh, professor viewpoint to say, oh, there's dignity in all work. It's easy to say um, until you're doing a job that isn't very, uh, physically comfortable, mentally comfortable. So I think, you know, my view is that you, and again, I, I will admit I'm very focused on U.S. policy, which is what I've studied, but I've argued there's been a real consensus in U.S. policy that's developed over the past several decades that we really want to, that we all agree the best outcome in a sense is to find work with decent wages for people. But something that's been certainly almost completely ignored by labor economists is, are there minimum standards for what that work looks like and what, what the conditions and uh, circumstances of that are? Um, the last thing I'll just respond to quickly is, um, I, I really do mean this to be serious and not just uh, introspection, but I wanted to speak to the, the idea um, uh, mentioned by Professor Galbraith that, that these jobs, the, the service jobs that have disappeared during COVID are not likely to come back. I guess I'm less sure. Again, I think this is a very unique recession. And uh, now to go to introspection, I guess I think as soon as I can get back to a life where I can, I can make use of those services, I, I'm ready to do it. And so I just think we're in really uncharted territory here, and we don't know what the recovery here is going to look like, except I think we now know it's not actually going to be a really sharp V recovery. Um, thank you both, and thanks for the question, John. And um, just for those of you, I, I usually say this at the beginning, but um, we one of the ways in which we run the seminar is that we read the work of the person and related work before they come. So um, we, we spent all last week having a great discussion um, about, uh, about Aaron's work. And um, it's, it's fun to see how it gets sort of repackaged and people's thoughts along the way, including my own. Um, but one question, that Stuart is asking, and he doesn't have a request to speak. So, do you want me to speak for you, Stuart? Oh, I'm, I can. Do you want? Yes, you can. You 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 share. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, we have a question from Stuart McDonald, um, which says, "As you know, many of us are law students, but I'm going to actually combine his two questions. Um, so, uh, I, I I think that as as somebody who is in law and thinks about um, the effects of law on distribution um, and not just redistribution and thinks about law as part of the problem, not just the solution. Um, Stuart channeled that um, and asked, 
Um, so, I mean, he's asking a little bit of both. So what's the law's role in the problems you're talking about? Um, and then can international law play a role in ameliorating them? I think that's partly because we read your work on the ILO. But I want to encourage you to really focus on the first one. Um, so what role has the law played? And I wouldn't, and, and further in global overcapacity and underemployment, um, and now I'll just amend it to say, and any of the other factors you identify as problematic. And mm. Anne would be welcome to uh, kick in there to her comments, especially since you identify some slightly different or maybe significantly different factors. Great. Um, we'll try to be uh, brief here about an incredibly large topic. I guess something that I've been really interested in and I would recommend the work of um, Arnie uh, Kalberg on precarious lives. He's the sociologist who's done comparative work on um, wealthy uh, democracies on this issue, but I think you can expand it even beyond that. To think differentially about the welfare state and about labor law regimes in different countries. Um, and I think from that perspective, what you'll see is that especially in the 80s and 90s, under conditions in which um, in the US, the US in the 80s, famously the American jobs machine rapidly recycled people out of um, unemployment into new different kinds of jobs. And European countries were really encouraged um, by international organizations to follow suit. So were countries around the world um, through IMF and World Bank restructuring, they were encouraged to um, flexibilize uh, their labor markets. And I think as a result, what you see is that in different countries, that's taken in very different forms. So um, in some countries, like for example, in <coughs> France, uh, you still have really strong protections for temporary workers. Um, whereas in countries like Italy and Germany, those uh, protections have really faded. Um, and of course, in many places in the world, um, labor laws were very strong. This was something the ILO recognized. Um, when you had really strong labor laws in a place like Kenya, um, those labor laws couldn't necessarily be supported by the society, given both um, how rapidly the labor force was growing and how slowly the, um, the economy was growing or creating jobs relative to that labor force. You had a pretty massive informal economy expanding, and that's where the term informality um, comes from. And I think that, I guess what I would say is that I think laws played an important, at least negative role in that um, what I think a lot of companies did, especially in the 80s, 90s, and, the two, and 2000s, was take advantage of different kinds of um, uh, sort of emerging holes or gaps in labor law that allowed for the expansion of different kinds of insecure work. And that what you'll see is that in different societies, those, those spaces where insecure work can emerge look very different. So in the country I am in right now, Germany, um, there was a kind of legal category of the mini job, which existed as a way to allow um, women with husbands who were formerly and standardly employed to work a little bit on the side and not have to pay taxes, but also their work didn't have a lot of the benefits and securities of um, their husband's jobs. Those mini jobs then became in the 90s and 2000s, a major site of expansion of all different kinds of insecure work for people who had no partner who was working in a standard job that would kind of support the existence of the mini job. So um, I think that again, like work like Vina Duval looking at places where in different countries, labor law has created these kind of spaces that firms take advantage of, also that workers take advantage of. Workers who need work and can't find work also look for spaces of illegal or gray area legal zones um, to find employment in ways that then put them at risk of, um, yeah, not having the protections of law when their wages are stolen or when their jobs um, um, are in other ways deficient. So I think that's a kind of very interesting part of the legal story of this. And it also speaks to the limits, I think, to some extent of the ability of labor law to fix the problem. Because in some ways, I think, um, insofar as you close, in, in an economy where um, that isn't growing very quickly and that where people need work, um, 
efforts to secure a more um, protective labor uh, law framework are sometimes associated with the movement of these jobs into unregulated space, different unregulated spaces. So you can end up in a kind of whack-a-mole type situation where there's moving um, insecurity. But that isn't to say that it's not incredibly important to do this work of, um, of trying to change a lot. Just to give you one example of the whack-a-mole thing, um, this has already happened in Germany and it's now happening probably in California. There's this effort to get a company like Uber to actually employ its workers. Um, and Uber's response in Germany, where they were forced to do this, was just to franchise the work. So they still don't employ any of their drivers. Um, they've created new kinds of subcontracting relationships where those drivers are now employed by third party companies um, that allow Uber to continue to have no obligations from a legal perspective for those workers. So those are, I guess, some of the things to think about um, when, yeah, when you're thinking about that. I'm not a law person though. So that's just, you know, that's my sense of it as a historian and, um, um, and yeah, from, from the areas that I do know. So thank you for the question. Great. Did, Anne, do you wanna yeah, I, think just about the law? Quickly, I can't, who can resist? Um, I, I think I may be even less of a, a law person, but I guess the, the thing that is interesting to me and one of the, you know, I mentioned that I felt like in 2018, 19, there were some signs in the U, in US labor markets, I thought that certain large companies were recognizing that they were kind of up against the limits of, you know, whether they could do their business treating workers in pretty bad ways. And so we got some voluntary wage floors and we started to get companies taking seriously, you know, not canceling shifts with no notice and things like that. And to me, my hope was that that was sort of the beginning of, of some movement that would allow us in the US to maybe tiptoe into some uh, labor regulations that we really, you know, in our economy haven't haven't seen very much of in a very, very, very long time. So I don't know if my optimism of that moment uh, remains in 2020, but that was sort of um, related to some of my thoughts I mentioned. Great, and Nathan had his finger up, two fingers up to jump yes. in. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you so much for, uh, first, uh, thank you uh, everyone for coming today and specifically both Aaron and Anne for uh, speaking. Uh, um, but um, definitely wanted to add on to that, um, uh, or, or at least like sort of uh, ask a question, but also give some like context. But um, definitely uh, the stuff you've been bringing up about how labor law has sort of in many ways like developed a lot of gaps that have been exploited by a uh, big law. Uh, I mean, a lot of uh, very prominent uh, labor law professors, uh, specifically Sharon Block uh, at Harvard Law, um, uh, she herself has at some points uh, suggested that like the NLRA, which is the founding sort of uh, law for uh, for labor in the United States, be completely done away with and uh, uh, replaced with a stronger, uh, stronger legislation. Um, and I, I think another thing that I wanted to sort of like, I, and I think this is just more sort of like from my sort of just general sort of like uh, uh, picking up on uh, on things is just sort of like how big law has uh, very much over time uh, has picked up like a very specialty in like how to uh, offer services for companies to skip around uh, and find these gaps and these loopholes and uh, how that like you basically with big law firms you take uh, they, they recruit some of the, the smartest and most talented people from law school and then they turn them around to specifically go into these places to find these these cracks in the labor law and exploit them and uh, further exploit uh, the, uh, the employee. But I guess um, I, I, it's all a long way of sort of like going to my question, which is like, what role do you think labor unions can serve going forward or like something that has been suggested to me um, uh, from someone that is a public interest, uh, public interest like lawyer themselves, is that like, labor unions themselves are a dying dinosaur is that do you see that as what's happening or would do you think that there's still a space for not only labor unions to survive but also thrive and possibly lead uh this uh redistribution of, of labor that's a that's a very important question um and i guess you know to me 
something that I, I think it's really interesting a mo to live in a moment, again, you know, kind of reference figure for me, if, if a negative one sometimes or most of the time. But it's, even Larry Summers has come out again recently and said, like, after decades of advocating all these things like labor flexibility, maybe workers are just too weak now. Like, they just don't have the bargaining power um, to push for, for higher wages. And, you know, economists, some economists are, are, are even saying that maybe higher inflation, you know, even with tight labor markets, without a strong organized labor force, you're just not actually getting that. Um, and it is true, actually, you know, um, uh, even in the last, um, uh, in, 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 even in the weak business cycles that have happened since the, the 90s, usually nominal wage growth hits 4% at some point towards the end of the cycle. Um, and that didn't even happen. We've had the longest business cycle, you know, in the post-war era. And there was at no point at which nominal wage growth hit that, that bar. Um, so wages weren't even as high. In spite of the apparent tightness of the labor market, wages just really were not on, on average rising um, at levels achieved before. And the role, the, the absence of organized labor um, probably has a big part to play in that story. The caution I would make is that even countries that have much stronger labor law and stronger unions, are, are they have way better wage growth than the US. I mean, both stronger labor law and stronger unions in Europe, way better. But they still see similar trends of declining unionization um, and growing gaps between wages and productivity. I think part of the reason for that is that unions don't are, are actually very disadvantaged in an economic climate in which the economy isn't growing very quickly. So one of the main things that German labor unions did in the 80s and 90s is organize wage cuts for their workers, right? Because they recognize that preserving jobs can only come through in a weak in, uh, economic environment and facing declining international competitiveness it was only through holding down their own workers' demands for higher wages that they could keep those workers' um, jobs. So even in places where unions have been stronger, um, that's, been, uh, that's been a really big problem. And I guess, you know, in my view, a lot of the politics that we have um, across the political spectrum have been so much based on this idea of, um, endless and and the possibility of having high rates of economic growth and facing both um, decades of slowdown and the coming ecological crisis which is coming now very quickly um, it seems apparent to me that you know there has to be a pretty big change in the politics and yeah i'm not sure how that's exactly going to happen but i i worry that even even union projects tend to require the capacity of labor capital courts to generate high growth and generate high, you know, to, to fulfill the demand for higher wages that um, there's a lot of room for that in the US economy. But I'm just saying, even in places um, where there are strong unions, it, it hits, it has hit these, these limits. We have a question here that was actually sent by someone in advance, um, I think a couple of days ago. Um, it's from Yumping uh, Zhang, who is in the, a student in the law, stu in the law school. Um, and they ask, from a corporate governance perspective, how could board members take into consideration the impact of automation on the stakeholders of the company? For example, the replaced workers and their families. Specifically, what measures should the board take, if at all, to mitigate the potential, uh, potential damages to the community? Is it even the responsibility for the board to think about these issues since they may not be directly related to shareholder interest? You know, fascinating question. That's definitely being asked at Davos um, this year and in recent years about, and in, and in the pages of the Financial Times about the possibilities of um, a new kind of capitalism, the great reset, et cetera. Um, I'm not particularly, you know, holding my breath on that. I think that a lot of companies are, um, I mean, I, I don't know. There's a lot to say about it. I mean, we're talking about the law perspective. It seems pretty clear that, um, that um, a lot of companies are really um, 
spending a lot of effort right now on on financial um, uh, accounting measures that help them keep a, a lot of income overseas and using creative measures to um, assign profits to low tax areas and prevent that money from flowing into higher tax areas. Um, and so, you know, it, it doesn't seem very likely to me that corporate governance is going to shift in this Davos desired direction towards higher social responsibility. I think that the that is likely to only happen under conditions where there's such a massive threat to, um, you know, the legitimacy of our market societies that um, change happens. But I don't think even, I don't think that even very well-intentioned um, corporate board members are going to have very much luck, even referring to the Davos program, um, pushing through those kind of changes. You look like you wanted to jump in, Anne. No, I, I really agree. I mean, it's very, I, I'm very pessimistic that that is, I think right now, the answer to the question is, is it the responsibility of the board to think about those issues? No. And so you have to think about how do you change that view of what the, what the responsibility of a corporate board is. And that's um, certainly in the US, that's a really heavy lift. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add, and to go back to the law in the role, um, or the role of law in the problems, because I think, I mean, right, the reason it's not the responsibility is because of corporate law. Right. And you just mentioned tax law, Erin, and in your work, some of the work we read, you talked about the need to eliminate private property. Um, so I just um, wanted to say that I think, you know, part of what we try to do, and I think a lot of folks who've been very committed to labor law for a long time are also saying labor law is not the place to do it, right? For some of the reasons you mentioned, but also just because it's about kind of playing with the margins, given the state that we're in already, um, and that it's it's more maybe slightly redistributive, redistributive than really distributing things differently um, from the beginning. So I, 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 the question was partly, I think that in fact, you have a lot of ideas about um, about laws that could be and need to be changed to address the issues, which is part of the reason you turn to social movements more broadly. So I think some of that same impulse could be really useful in thinking about the law. Can I, um, can I also plug um, Katerina Pister's book, The Ca Code of Capital? Uh, Sorry, again, late, late night brain, but um, it's an incredible book that, that really describes the way that I think internationally and really, na you know, U.S. or New York and London um, have played this incredible role in helping um, holders of wealth to 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 um, legally define and code the wealth in a way that makes it inaccessible to tax authorities and kind of the immense effort that's been put into that. I found that to be a really fascinating take on that um, that issue. Would you mind putting that in the chat? Yeah, of course. Okay. Um, I'm now I've gotten, you know, addicted to the chat for my, my bibliographies. Um, Michelle has a question and is also up to ask the question. Yes, thank you, Karen. Um, okay, so my question sort of goes back to something that we were talking about a little bit earlier, and that is this distinction between wanted versus unwanted leisure. Um, and when I think about that distinction, of course, we have to remember that that's like a very historically constructed distinction. And the kind of language that we use to describe these two dom domains is also shifting over time. Um, and of course, that myth of, you know, what leisure means ha and how it's been historically related to this idea of laziness, right, has a kind of origin as well. And as Aaron, you might remember, I do study a lot of the history of slavery and unfree labor. Um, and I think about how, you know, we were, we sort of start in this moment in the early days of capitalism or the capital or early days of capital expansion where the sort of prevailing anxiety was all about trying to dispossess labor in order to meet the demands for the global labor market, right? So the kind of language that emerges out of that is something like a language around laziness. So if you're not producing for this global machine, 
there's a whole kind of um, there's a whole discourse around how we're going to denigrate activities that don't produce for that machine. Jump to today, we're in this world where, you know, I love the phrase that you use in your piece where you talk about the slack in the labor market, right? Where you've had this historical process of dispossession, you know, the kind of um, denigration of people who don't conform to this ideology, right? And it seems we're going, we're switching a different way now where, you know, laziness has turned into self-care or laziness has turned into, you know, um, something else which is being described in this more positive light. What does that mean for, you know, this kind of historical arc and how we've started talking about le leisure? And then what is the sort of change that we're going to see when we start talking about work? So everyone's been saying like, okay, work is not sufficient. We're going to blur the boundaries, but I've yet to hear anyone come up with a term which replaces work. You know, it's like activity that requires energy in order to do something, activity which produces something, but then we all kind of get lost. So do you have another word that we can use? Um, and do you see that this is just the new age of like talking about both leisure and work, and it's everything to do with where we are in capitalism at the moment. I think it's, you know, you make me think of, um, I feel like I have a lot of friends who, who sort of split into two camps, and obviously this is a very privileged, in a way, a certain kind of privileged sector, sector of society, but, but maybe not totally. Um, some people, you know, like, I think of many people I know who got their PhDs and just cannot find a tenure track job, right? And those people have this kind of like passionate attachment to their work identity. Like they're committed to the intellectual project of their life as a career, even though they can't find steady work in those kinds of jobs. That's kind of an interesting disconnect there, you know, between their, um, desire to sell their labor in a certain respect and their sense of self, like they're, they're committed to their work-based identity more than the market will bear them in some way. And then on the other hand, I know people who are like, you know, they don't really have any commitment to their jobs at all. Like they just take whatever, especially in where I am right now in Berlin, this is still more of a phenomenon. I think when you think of like the slackers of the nineties in the U S you know, the dream of Portland is alive in Berlin or something like that to quote that show or kind of paraphrase that, that show where you have these people who just have, they have no work-based identity at all. They just work when they run out of money. Mm -hmm. And then as long as they have money, they're just doing these other things. And it's not that they're, in fact, those people don't have to do as much self-care in a lot of ways because they're not so beaten down by their work-based life but they have all kinds of weird things that they're into, right? They have all of this kind of stuff they do that is not remunerated by society in any way, but that they feel is very important and gives them a kind of identity and coherence to their life that has nothing to do with the wage-based world, right? So I guess that's not really an answer, but it's sort of like, I guess in my, I, I've been reading a lot of utopian thinkers and I find their distinction between sort of like, um, on the one hand, necessary work, like the work we need to do to make society possible. There's a lot of work that has to be done in order for us to all get on with our time and day um, and, and, and to be able to feel, feel existentially secure and free. And then there's a kind of free voluntary association even people like hayek talk about this you know that the, even a market society it needs people to be engaged in all of this kind of associative um labor that's just totally outside of the market system and all different kinds of very on the total opposite side from hayek think about this kind of associative non-market associative activity as, as incredibly important for civil society and also just as an end in itself, just the kinds of things people do um, as, as, it's, as having its own worth, you know, um, without providing something to a larger society, even if it provides to the association. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I've been thinking a lot about that stuff, but I don't have a particularly good answer to the immediate question of how to 
redefine those terms. But I think that in the Gal in the story Professor Galbraith was telling about a world where we don't really need that, you know, a lot of the labor that we're ha asking people to do is just excessive in some way and somewhat unnecessary. Um, yeah, it seems it seems really important to to ask those kinds of questions. So I don't know, those are just some thoughts about it. But I think it's a totally important. On the other hand, what you said before should also be said that totally still exists, right? That there's a huge, and in many parts of the world, re-emergent racist discourse around the idea that those who are not working are not working because they're lazy and that they shouldn't be in this country if they're immigrants or, you know, there's a whole range of um, re-emergent social Darwinist discourses which have, which are, which, which are, yeah, which, which are not going away anytime soon. Um, we have one minute, um, and maybe we'll make it three, because uh, my colleague Michelle Dickerson, who writes on the struggling middle class, um, put a question in the chat and has agreed to speak it. <laughs> Michelle. Um, I've enjoyed both of your talks, and I'm going to talk really fast, only because we only have a couple of minutes. Um, I wonder whether we should just assume that labor laws are not the solution and that changes to corporate governance are not the solution and that we should instead focus on tax laws. The reason I say that is we can always tell what we value uh, in the United States based on what we choose to tax or not to tax. So sh when we're thinking about the future of work, should we think in terms of things like, and I've heard different people write about them, sort of robot or technology taxes? Should we focus more on taxing wealth because, you know, Elon Musk and, you know, several other folks that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, they're doing just fine right now. Uh, whereas even if we raised the wages of the low wage service workers to $15 an hour, they are still not going to be able to accomplish and live what we sort of traditionally think of as a middle class life in this country. So should we focus on sort of other ways to get people to conform their behavior, namely by taxing certain activities more than others? Great question. I, I'm all for the punitive wealth tax. You know, I think that Keynes says this too. He says in a slow growing economy, the justification of extreme inequality is just it, there isn't one, you know, the idea that these people have wealth because they are the job makers and the investors is simply not true. And there's just no reason for it to exist. And so it should be taxed out of existence. I think something that's really interesting, the other side of that kind of argument that someone like Keynes would have made, and again, someone like, again, I disagree with him about this, but someone like Larry Summers is making about secular stagnation, an area which has probably just been out of vogue for a very long time, I don't even know if it has a category in legal theory, is like investment law. Like in the sense that, um, you know, in, in the past, and this idea is being revived again, there are all these ideas about how governments should, should get in the business of either um, forcing, encouraging, or undertaking themselves investment. And this is a huge issue around the idea of the Green New Deal, or in Europe, what's been proposed now around green bonds and different kinds of central bank interventions of um, various kinds that enter all of this new uncharted territory. I don't know even what, you know, what is the legal status or how does one think legally about quantitative easing and all of these other kinds of totally new and I think probably legally unframed um, in some respect, actions, uh, extraordinary economic actions that are being taken. So I don't know if there's a category like that, but I would say tax law and maybe the other side is something to do with um, public investment. I will just say, I think if you are looking to correct inequality, I, I think it's hard to argue that a wealth tax is going to be more powerful. We just, the distribution of wealth in the US and in many countries is so so much more skewed even than the distribution of income that that's where you're actually going to have some power i think the one sort of practical caveat to that goes back to some things aaron was talking about which is that there are very sophisticated ways to avoid wealth taxes and so it's a it requires some very um deep thinking about the way you would construct those laws but that i guess i will leave to the the law students. <laughs>
Ah, but we thought we were going to turn you both into lawyers. Um, <laughs> we, we definitely need your, your, your insights. Um, so thank you both for a wonderful conversation. And actually, I will say that the respondent speaker back and forth worked better here than it does, I have to admit, in, in, a, in a physical room. Um, huh. But maybe that's because we need to set up our room differently. So um, I learned something from this. Um, thank you to the, um, those with cameras on and, with, and off and in the uh, YouTube live. So um, we, if, if, thank you for uh, being here, staying for the full time and continuing to think beyond um, what your paper and work suggested, um, both Aaron and Anne. Um, so this was a terrific kickoff and we look forward to the next talk in two weeks. Um, so everyone want to so join me then. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And good night. Okay. <laughs>